Today we're going to um, continue our series on Revelation, and I'm going to be focusing on Revelation 3, verses 1 to 13. And this passage um, is focusing on two letters that Jesus wrote to a church in Sardis and a church in Philadelphia. They're actually towns that existed 2,000 years ago, and we're going to be focusing on this, but the letters aren't just um, to Christians 2,000 years ago. These letters are to us. These letters are to our church today. These letters are to you, and there are going to be uh, many things in them that will, you'll find relevant, hopefully encouraging, and maybe convicting. So, um, as we've been going through the series, each preacher has kind of touched on that when we read Revelation, it's a, um, a, the the book is written in a language, a lot of it is in a language which we call apocalyptic um, literature or language. Um, And so, that this, we have to realize that this language is designed for the people that were um, of the day. Um, We don't use apocalyptic language anymore. It's hard to find something that's relevant with apocalyptic language um, of today. But um, the message behind Revelation is still very, very relevant to us. Um, So, when we read the Bible normally, if we just go to the first slide, um, when we read the Bible, it's always good, any parts of the Bible, it's always good to first try to find the original meaning of the passage, to try to work out what was going on at the time when the person wrote the letter or the the book. Um, That's the first thing that we should try to do. And once we've done that, once we've got some sort of understanding, this is for any book in the New Testament or Old Testament, once we get that understanding of what was happening at the time, then we can actually work out what it means to us today. Um, Then we can really work out what God is trying to tell the church today. However, when people read Revelation, sometimes they forget this kind of basic idea of biblical interpretation, they do it in a different way. So, when they read Revelation, if we go to the next um, slide, sometimes they read Revelation and they just see the future. They just kind of read into the future and some people go, wow, this is all about the end times. When's the end times going to happen? When is Jesus going to come back? Who's the Antichrist? Who's the beast? Don't put anything on your skin that could be like 666 because it's a mark of the beast. And so, you hear these um, stories throughout history that people start freaking out because of what they've read from Revelation. So, there's the stories, I think some of you may have lived through it, um, in the 70s when the bank card first came out, people thought it was the mark of the beast and they freaked out. Um, but we just need to make sure when we read Revelation, it's just, we have to read it the same way as we read all the Bible. We need to keep that good biblical interpretation. It is about the future, a lot of Revelation is about the future, but we need to read it in the light of um, what it first meant. So, I've got my last little um, slide here. So, as we read um, Revelation, the way we should read it, um, Ryan, if you can get that next one up, is um, we've got to find what the original meaning was. Revelation was written originally to seven churches in um, an area called Asia Minor. That's the original context of Revelation. Once we work out what was happening at that time, what was the whole purpose of Revelation? Why did John write um, Revelation to those churches? Then we can actually get a clear message of why, what what it means to us today. Um, And when there are parts that do actually point to the future, those Um, that is God painting this picture of what is going to happen, and that actually is going to, that can inform us today. That can inform us how we should actually live today. So, that's kind of a good way of reading Revelation. So, um, with that in mind, let's just have a look at the quick context of Revelation. If we just go to the next slide, Ryan, thank you. We have, this is a map of the seven churches which Revelation is actually being written to. And so, John Um, he was on this island called Patmos at the time, and he gets this vision of Jesus, he gets this clear picture of what he needs to tell the churches, and the message is from Jesus. Um, And so, he's telling, he writes this book, this revelation, to seven churches, and each of the churches are going through different things, some are doing awesome, 
some aren't doing so well, and Jesus wants to encourage them, convict them, remind them that He is coming, remind them He, he is victorious because He died and He rose again. And so today we're looking at two churches, we're looking at church number five and six, we're looking at Sardis and Philadelphia. Um, so let us um, get straight into um, this letter to Sardis. So it's Revelation um, chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. The angel of the church in Sardis writes, These are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the stars. Now, straight away we can see this is kind of bizarre language. We don't use this language anymore. Um, so we need to understand kind of what it's, what's he saying. Um, but really, this one's pretty straightforward. These are the words of him. Who's the him? It, the him is Jesus. These words that are about to be spoken are from Jesus. These are Jesus' words. They're God's words to the church. These are God's words to you. Um, we've got to get that in our minds. Um, and that picture of the seven spirits and the seven stars, that gets referenced first in chapter 1 of Revelation, where John pick, draws this big, magnificent picture of what Jesus looked like, and he was holding these seven stars. And the seven stars are the seven angels of the church, and it seems like the idea that you get is that each church has an angel kind of looking over it. It could be an angel, or it could be a messenger, um, a human messenger, but most scholars think it's actually just an angel. Each church seems to have an angel. And so I like the thought that our church has an angel too. Um, but this angel is meant to write these words. This, this is the angel um, to speak these words, and these words are from Jesus. What are the words? They are awkwardly confronting. Um, for the first Christians that heard this, and for us, for some of us. So, let's hear them. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. This is challenging. We have to remember that um, the four letters before this to the four previous churches, they all heard this about the Christians and Sardis, and I can picture the Christians and Sardis waiting. They've heard the four churches, and they're like, oh, they had all these things wrong with them and all this, and Sardis is waiting. Here we go. This is ours now. We're, we're hearing the, um, Jesus' words to us, and straight into it, Jesus is saying, your reputation is that you're alive. Everything's good, but you're actually dead. This is really challenging. In the, the, the previous four letters, Jesus kind of has the principle of kind of the kiss, kick, kiss principle. When you write, I'm a teacher, when I write reports for a, like a report card, it's always good to say something nice and encouraging in the first line. Then if there's anything that, like they're lazy, you, you kind of write it like in a nice way. You write so, something like they're inattentive or... If, um, um, easily distracted or something like that, but really they're just lazy. Um, and then you end the report with something nice again, the kiss, kick, ki um, kiss, kick, kiss principle. Jesus did that for the other four churches. In this part, there's no kisses. He doesn't start with a kiss, he just gets straight into kicking them. Straight away, he goes, this is what I've got against you. What was happening in Sardis is that they were actually experiencing um, something that other churches weren't experiencing. They were actually experiencing no persecution, that, or if it was, it was very limited. Where in the other churches of the time, the other churches Jesus is writing to, it, um, the, the churches were experiencing massive persecution, um, either from within, things were happening within the church, or from externally. In Sardis, none of that was kind of really happening. And what was probably happening is that they got, to their, they got so comfortable that they got complacent in what they had heard, that they, were, they did hold on to the gospel, they did hold on to Christ, but they got so complacent in their being so comfortable um, and got busy in life and did other things that really they became spiritually dead. And Jesus here is saying, wake up. Um, and it's a challenging word because I feel today in our church, 
and not just our church, but the church in Australia, it is sometimes very comfortable. It's starting to get a little bit prickly when you watch like shows like Q&A or you hear things from the media. So, the, the Christians are starting to get a little, attacked a little bit, but generally, we're pretty comfortable. And it's easy for us to, for, for the, this is to Christians, by the way, this is not to non-Christians, it's easy for Christians who have had hope in Christ in the past to keep playing the game, but really, if you're honest with yourself, you're actually spiritually dead. And this is the, actually the opposite of what Jesus wants for us. It's the, actually the opposite of our reality in Christ. The, the, our reality in Christ, Paul tells us in Romans, um, chapter 6, verse 10 to 11, this is the reality, that Jesus died, um, the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. But the Christians in Sardis were the opposite. They were um, alive in their sin, but dead to Christ. It was the complete opposite to their reality. And some of us, unfortunately, um, this has been a challenging message to me as well, some of us, in, in areas of our life, we are alive in, and we shouldn't be, and in other areas, we are dead in, um, which we should be. So, um, let's go to the next verse. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Revelation 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I come to you. Um, if you've held on to Christ as your Lord and Saviour, but you've, if you're honest with yourself, you have fallen away, you've let go of that help, that, uh, that hope, and you're actually grabbing on to other things, Jesus is saying to you, just like He said to the original church, it's time to wake up to that. It's time to actually um, hold on to that hope and repent. Repenting really just means turning around in the, the, from the direction that you're going and going in a different direction. And so for some of us, that message is very clear today. Um, and this is not a time, um, sometimes, because the, I love that first passage, it's so confronting, but you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. This is not a time to kind of think, because this is what I do when I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, this, oh, I wish this person was here, they should be hearing this, or, oh, I'm glad that person's over there, because this is perfect for them. <laughs> this is for you. Don't look around the auditorium. This is for you. Look within yourself. Is this, is this happening in your life? Um, let's keep going. Um, verse 4 and 5. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge that name before my Father and His angels. I love this picture that there were people in this, this church, the whole church wasn't dead. There were people in this church that were alive. Spiritually, they were alive to Christ, that they hadn't soiled their clothes. I like this picture of this kind of dirty clothing because I know for, for me, sometimes you're walking through life and you've been convicted in an area of your life in the past. There's an area in your life that you've kind of, God has been talking to you about, and on and on and on, but then you start ignoring it, you start ignoring it, and for, for at one stage, you get to the point where you've actually forgotten that what you're doing is actually really unhelpful for you and the people around you. Um, that you're kind of walking around and you're in dirty clothes, um, and you don't even know it. Um, and so, for me, there's, there's lots of examples of this, um, this happening. Um, if you own a, a business, if you own a business, it's um, awesome that you do that, um, but if you're at the point where you're kind of manipulating people for your own gain, um, because you're in control and you can do what you're doing, or say you're holding back on a little bit of tax because you just want to get forward, now understand why you might do these things, because you want to get that financial security, it's good, it's good to have, get financial security, you want to provide for your family. 
But if you're doing those kind of things, it's actually dodgy. It's not helpful. You're, when you're doing that, you're actually placing money above everything else. If you're actually manipulating people to get, um, to get financial gain. And this point might be something that you've heard before, you've been convicted before, but now you've been walking around, you've ignored it for so long, and you've, you're walking around with dirty clothes. Jesus is saying, wake up to that. Um, some of us might be here, and we're craving intimacy in our lives. You might actually be married but you're still craving intimacy. And what I, I kind of had my thought was, is that if you're in that place and you're craving intimacy, actively pursue your spouse. Some of you might be looking outside your marriage in this area. You're craving intimacy from outside your marriage. Some of you might have been caught up, and it's so common, it's so prevalent in our society now, but some of you you're married and you've caught up, you're caught up in pornography. And secular psychologists are saying that if you're looking at that too much, it actually changes your brain and it's harder for you to actually maintain intimate relationships in your life. And so I get this picture of you've got dirty clothes on and you're actually just trying to, you're trying to wash your clothes. You're trying to get better but you're actually, in the way that you're doing that, you're actually washing your clothes in dirty water. And Jesus is saying, it's not helpful, you need to stop, you need to wake up to this. So it might be something you've heard before, you've been ignoring it for so long, you need to wake up to that. That's what Jesus is saying in this, kind of, in this passage. And it is challenging. Um, but what I love is that in this passage, God wants you to be dressed in white. He actually wants to see you in white, and it's not actually anything to do with what you do. What, sometimes we get caught up trying to wash our clothes. We, try, we stuff up, it happens, we stuff up, we sin, and we're trying to wash our own clothes. But like I said, you get caught up trying to washing your own clothes, and the, what you're doing is just making it worse. God is saying, don't try to wash your own clothes. Let me dress you. Let me put white on you. Let me dress you in pure clothes. He wants to see you as pure because when you come under Christ, He actually sees you the same way as He sees His own Son. That's how great our gospel is. That's how, that's how um, grace works. He wants to see you just like He sees His own Son. And it's nothing about what we do, it's everything that what he, Jesus has already done. And so if you're in a state where you're trying to work it or work it, you, you know your, dirt, your clothes are dirty, but you keep seeing, seeming to get them dirtier, just stop that and try to see yourself the way that God wants to see you. See yourself as pure. See yourself the way that God sees you. That is the encouragement that, um, that Jesus is saying to this church. Uh, let us keep moving, Ryan, if we go to the next um, slide. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yes, this passage was for the, ch uh, the church in Sardis for 2,000 years ago, but it's the same message is for us today. Let, if the Spirit is talking to your heart right now, listen hear what He is saying. If it's relevant to you, it might not be anything to do with intimacy or, or financial things, it could be something else. If the Spirit is talking to your heart at the moment, listen. Hear what the Spirit says, is saying to you. All right, so that was the church in Sardis, the church in Philadelphia. If we um, click over to the next one. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right. These are the words of Him, these are Jesus' words again, who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door, and no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This is a really encouraging passage, and for the church of Philadelphia, this would have been very, very relevant for them. Basically, what's happening to these Christians in Philadelphia is that unlike the Christians in Sardis who got so complacent in their comfort, 
the Christians in Philadelphia were getting actively excluded from their old community. What was happening is that we need to realize that in the first century, majority of Christians were Jewish. Um, the majority of Christians were Jewish. And so, they would have grown up in families in a Jewish household waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the one to come um, that was from God. And then Jesus came and He died and He rose again. And there were many Jews that decided to follow Jesus, to hold Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And when they did that, the people who were Jews that didn't um, hold Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, um, they said, well, you can't be a Jew anymore. You're not a person of God anymore. You're not a child of God anymore. You're not a child of Abraham anymore. And so there were people, there was, what was happening in Philadelphia is that the synagogue at the time basically shut out Christian Jews. They were excluded from their community. And what Jesus is saying here is, no one shuts the door on me. No one shuts the door in front of me. You can come to me, the door is over, always open. So from, from in the town, people were saying, God doesn't love you anymore because you're holding on to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, the door is always open for me. He is, um, he, this is an encouragement. And I know for some people in this church, I've talked to many of you, that um, you may have been in a different community before. You might have been grown up in a different um, denomination. And because you've um, experienced Jesus in a real way, experienced Jesus and it, He's transformed your life, you might, be feel, you might actually feel excluded from a community that you were once in. Or because you've got faith in Christ, because you come to this church, you, there are people in your family that are actively excluding you or putting you down because you're, you're a Christian. Or because you um, are happy to admit that you're a Christian because, and you want to tell people that Christ has changed your life, you're getting actively excluded from your friendship groups. What this passage is saying to you today is no matter what people are saying, some people might say, you're in a cult, stop it. And that's actually quite intimidating. But what he's saying Jesus is saying is the door is always open to me. I love you. No matter what people say, I love you. The door is open to me. And keep, um, you've got little strength. It's hard. He understands that it's hard if you're in that situation. He understands that it's hard, but he's acknowledging your perseverance. Let's keep going. Um, I will make, now this is where it gets funny, but it's actually, when you actually know that context, it makes sense. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. What Jesus is saying here, he's not saying that the Jews are Satanists. He's not saying that the Jews are from Satan. But he is saying that if there's anyone who says that um, I don't, Jesus doesn't love you, that you can't come to God through Jesus, is a liar and is not of God. That's what he's saying. It's a strong language, but that's what he's saying. And so if you're in this position where people are attacking you because you're a Christian or because you've really become alive in Christ now, and not just following religion, um, my encouragement to you is don't try to win fights, like theological fights with those people. Don't try to beat them in theological fights. My encouragement is to pray for them, love them, and realize that the love of God for you will be known in the future. That you will, it will be known, no matter what you're going through, it will be known that God loves you, which is really encouraging. Um, we'll keep going. Verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, this is where it's funny because from verses 1 to 9, I fear we've done a good job at working out what the context is of this passage and working out how it relates to me or how it relates to you. 
But some people get to verse 10 and they, they forget the context and they go straight to future talk again. They go, oh, the hour of trial, oh, to test the inhabitants of the earth. Well, this is talking about the tribulation or this is talking about the millennium. This is talking about the rapture. But we've got to go back to the original context. What I find is that some people, when they're reading Revelation, as they, a lot of people have built a big story about the end times. They've created this grand narrative of what the end times will look like, that um, Jesus may partially come and then rapture all the Christians up, and then there will be this thousand years of everyone getting um, tormented in this great tribulation, and then Jesus will come actually again properly um, to judge the earth. That they've, and they've created this narrative and they've pulled verses out. This is one of them. They pull these verses out of context to create the story. We have to realize I'm a bit cynical about that story. Jesus will come. He will come and there will be a judgment. But I'm cynical about um, a, a big, this big grand story by pulling verses out of context throughout the whole Bible. Um, the big passage here is that um, the big point is that the people of um, Philadelphia were still going to get um, persecuted. It was still going to happen. And this was actually for all Christians, for all inhabitants of the earth, it was only going to get worse, this persecution, before it was going to get better. But Jesus would hold on to them through that situation. He would keep them. He would keep them safe. He would hold on to them. And that's what happened. Um, and so that's the passage that we're not... Um, that's what we need to focus on. And that's for us as well. If you're going through that situation that you're getting actively excluded from your family or from your friends or from an old community, it may not get better from the outside. It still may keep happening. But the encouragement is God is going to keep hold of you throughout that situation. He's going to hold you safe. He's going to guard your heart. Um, so be encouraged by those words. Um, Verse 11, three, uh, 11 and 12. I am coming to you soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. Now, if we're following this way that we're doing biblical interpretation, that we're working out what the original meaning meant, and then you're hearing things like, I am coming to you soon. So this is Jesus saying to the Christians, 2,000 years ago, I am coming to you soon. This can get confusing because, in my mind, soon is in a couple of months or in a couple of years or at least in the lifetime of the Philadelphians. But it's 2,000 years and he hasn't come yet. This is confusing. Why hasn't he come? He said he's going to come soon. But what I always come back to is that God's story is a big story that it is a big story. We are only a fraction of that story. Our lives are only a fraction. And so, um, and we, we've got to kind of remember that, to say the time of Abraham, and that by, by, between the time of Abraham and the time of Jesus, that was 2,000 years. And God was moving throughout that whole time. And now it's been about 2,000 years from the time of Jesus to today. Now, some people might start freaking out and saying, the end times are coming. He moved once, um, 2,000 years. He might move again after 2,000 years. Who knows? I don't know. But the big point is our lives, our attitudes need to be of that He is coming soon. That if we get so complacent like the Christians of Sardis, we get so comfortable in our leisure. And I, oh, I love being comfortable. Um, you can ask my wife. I love couch time. It's one of my favorite activities. But if we get so complacent in our comfort, that we forget um, that Jesus is actually coming. I love what Laura said today. If we are sowing, if we're watering and sowing into things that aren't going to grow, they're not going anywhere, then um, we are realizing we're not, we don't have this attitude that Jesus is coming, that there will be a judgment, um, and that He's given us things to do um, today as Christians. Um, I love this picture of this pillar that we will, Christians, people who follow Christ, will be this pillar in the temple of God. And basically what that means is that God usually is known within a temple. He, that's how um, God, um, 
people of God or the people of God throughout history have kind of known where God is within the temple. And what um, Jesus is saying is that I will make you a pillar in this temple, meaning you will always be with me. You're always going to be with me. And this is my favorite part, this next um, passage, um, verse um, tw- further on in verse 12. Ryan, if you want to bring it up. I will write on them. So this is on this pillar. If you can all picture yourselves as these pillars. Um, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. On this pillar, on you, God has written his name on you. God has written where you actually belong. When he's talking about the new Jerusalem, that's actually just saying, it it really describes in Revelation 21. It's saying that um, at the end, heaven actually comes down to earth and a new reality is created. It's not that after we die, we get buzzed up into heaven and we sit on the clouds or we're off somewhere else. The reality for humans is on earth. So what actually happens at the end is heaven comes down to earth and earth and heaven kind of get put together and a new reality is created that God is with creation forever, just like it was always meant to be. And that's actually where we belong. He's written that on us. That's where, and that's where how this, this future actually can inform us how we should live. If we're just walking around life right now and we're sowing into things that won't be in that future reality, what's the point? Why are we doing that? We need to find things that are actually going to be participating in that, new re, in that reality, this heaven and earth joining reality, because that's where we belong. And I love it because our culture loves to put names on us, loves to define us, loves to say, this is your identity, even when we might not want it to be our identity. They love to say, your gender is your identity, or your sexuality is your identity, or your occupation is your identity, or your marital status is your identity. But that's not your identity. Your identity is a child of God. That is your identity because that's your, ma- your maker, your maker, God, has given you that definition. Um, and that's what I love. I love this part of the passage um, because it's so easy to define ourselves even in our past. I know for me, when I was a young teenager, my parents got divorced. And for a long time, I defined myself as a child of divorce. It, it, it shaped who I was. And so as I went through high school, after high school, I'm just like, man, I didn't do very well at high school. That must have been because of the divorce. I was, it was a terrible time. Or I looked at myself and I see all these bad habits and I, I said, oh, it must be because of the divorce. I didn't have a stable home at, when I was a child developing. Or I look at stats that say that um, children of divorce are more likely to get divorced. And it freaks me out because I don't want to get divorced. I love my wife. I want to be with her forever. And, but this encouragement is that my identity isn't a child of divorce. My identity is a child of God. And it makes a whole big difference in my life because God sees me as loved. God sees me as whole. God sees me just the way he sees his son. And that's how he sees you too. Um, if you follow Christ, your identity is firmly set in Him, um, and we need to remember that. Let's just, on oh, the last part, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This isn't just for the Philadelphians, it's for you. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you right now. Is He encouraging you with something? Is the Spirit trying to encourage you in something? Do you need to be lifted up in this area? Are you finding yourself um, believing the names that society wants to place on you? Remember what the Spirit is saying to you. Um, Or is God convicting you of something? Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you. And let's do that as we pray.